Um, yes. Um, hi, everybody. So it's uh, 8 p.m. somewhere in the UK. And uh, so I suppose it's uh, some different times in other places on the earth. Uh, so welcome back to VSA Online. So after the Christmas break, uh, so today we start the new season, uh, which will continue uh, throughout uh, uh, spring in the Northern Hemisphere, at least. And, uh, and then um, I have an idea to end this uh, season with some physical uh, discussion meeting as uh, similar to the one we had uh, in the previous season online, but maybe this time it will be hybrid, like physical and, um, and online uh, together. But uh, I will send a separate announcement for that. So uh, for the first talk uh, in this season, I'm very happy to uh, to welcome Mohamed Alam from the University of Maryland. And uh, uh, well, without any further delay, so I leave the floor to you, Mohamed. Uh, so please start sharing screen and go on. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Mahmoud Alam. I'm a PhD student in computer science at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. The work I will be presenting today uh, it was an ICML paper from last year. It's called Deploying Convolutional Networks on Untrusted Platform Using 2D Holographic Reduced Representation. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Edward Ruff, T. Morse, and James Hall uh, in collaboration with the Laboratory of Physical Science and Bruce Allen Hamilton. So the goal of the work is to develop a system that can be deployed on a re remote third party for inferential steps uh, securely. So it is more, uh, more often uh, uh, quite a, uh, a regular, uh, in a regular basis, we can see that models are deployed on a, a third party for inferential steps. Uh, however, there is a potential, uh, potential of uh, uh, losing the data and the model and uh, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, protecting it uh, by obfuscating the uh, nature of the input and output of the uh, data and uh, the model. So for this, we developed this fast heuristic uh, pseudo encryption uh, model, which we are calling connection is symbolic pseudo secret or CSPS in short. So the, uh, the way it would work uh, uh, is that uh, we will develop a neural network with uh, pseudo encryption style defense uh, using a neural symbolic representation, uh, specifically uh, holographic reduced representation. So, uh, as a, a brief uh, introduction to holographic reduced representation, uh, uh, it's a better, better uh, symbolic architecture which can be used to combine multiple concepts together. So, for instance, if, if you have a uh, if you have four vectors that represent shape, square, color, and red, you can combine them into a single vector using the bind operation. And you can later query the bound representation with the, with the shape, and it will return an approximation of the original, uh, the, sh uh, the original shape, which is uh, in this case a square. So the, the binding uh, operation can be calculated using uh, fast Fourier transform because uh, is the convolution of the two vectors. So we can efficiently uh, perform the convolution using FFT. And uh, the unbinding is the same binding operation with the inverse of the vector in Fourier domain. Uh, uh, however, uh, one uh, issue with this uh, binding and unbinding operation because of uh, it uh, represent all information into a single fixed dimensional space. Uh, it necessarily introduced noise to it. And because of this, uh, there is a, a, a data loss uh, in the process. So for this, we'll be applying a projection step, which will project the data points onto the surface of a complex ball. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the projection step normalizes the vectors in Fourier domain. And uh, by doing so, we can actually 
increase the similarity score for a single bound term up to uh, 100 percent so if you add more bound terms the accuracy or the retrieval accuracy or will be lowered and uh, however for a single bound term the similarity score for the original vector and the uh, uh, and the retrieve vector uh, will always be one and uh, please uh, feel free uh, feel free to stop me and ask question if you have uh, throughout the presentation so uh, in this uh, demo code uh, so th there is a uh, uh, in the left side uh, you have this code where x and y which are uh, sample from I, iid a normal distribution which can be bound together and uh, using unbinding operation the y underscore which is the, the approximation of y is retrieved and if you calculate the person similarity between them uh, you will get 71 percent uh, similarity however just applying the position step or normalizing the vectors uh, in Fourier domain uh, the similarity score become one and we will be using this projection step in our work uh, to get a better result. So any questions so far? No, I think so far so good. Okay. So how we can now, uh, like the main goal of this work is to uh, is to do image classification on a remote third party and the third party will not have the access to our data and the model so everything will be encrypted so how we can apply this uh, concept of hrr uh, into to, to this space so first approach could be uh flatten uh flatten the images into vector and then perform the hr operations and uh, after um, uh, after making the bound representation, we can reshape everything back to the original shape. So that could be one option. And the second approach could be applying 2D FFT uh, in the binding and unbinding operations. And uh, we found that by uh, by doing the 2D FFT, uh, it's basically uh, same as doing uh, 1D FFT to a vector. Uh, so we will be use the second approach. So, which will uh, directly bind the secret uh, to the image, and then uh, apply un will be apply unbinding to remove the secret. Uh, here, secret is sample from a uh, normal distribution uh, with projection uh, that I described earlier, and uh, the secret has the same shape as the original image. Uh, here you can see in the figure that uh, in the original uh, secret is a bound with the original image, which is shown in D. And uh, by knowing the original secret, uh, the secret portion can be eliminated from the bound image and uh, the original image can be retrieved uh, without any loss. So in our uh, in expectation, the goal is to apply the uh, apply the secret to the beginning of the network and uh, at the end of the network we will be uh, using the same secret to unbind or remove the noise and uh, we expect that that would uh, remove the noise part and uh, uh, the processed information from the network without any noise will be used for final uh, classification so the 2d hrr the binding operation is equivalent to another convolutional layer to the network so we will be just adding another layer on top of existing convolutional network and uh, because of this uh, the subsequent la layer of the convolution and uh, the pooling layers uh, we learn to retain the structure of the secret so that at the end of the network when unbinding will be applied using the same secret uh, only the uh, knowledge uh, portion will be eliminated and uh, the processed information uh, that is learned by the network will remain. So this is the CSPS network that we proposed. Uh, on uh, the first stage, uh, secret. Uh, so th those secrets are used as one-time pack. So 
for every single uh, image, the secrets are defined. And uh, every time uh, they are generated randomly. So in the first stage, uh, the original image will be bound with the secrets. Uh, in the middle stage, uh, we are using a unit architecture. So there is uh, there's a couple of benefits of using UNET. Uh, it's a deep uh, convolutional network and uh, it has identical input and output shape. So which is necessary for uh, performing the unbinding operation at the end of the network. And in the uh, third stage, uh, we have uh, two smaller network here. And uh, this adversarial network is used only during the training. So during the inference, there will be, there will be no adversarial network. So this branch actually uh, actually works like an if else clause. So in the prediction uh, in the prediction branch, unbind uh, the same secret. Uh, by which the original image is bound with uh, will be applied for unbinding. And uh, after the unbinding, the uh, data will be passed to a, a smaller network, which will be used for final classification. The adversarial network is the, exactly the same network as the prediction network. However, uh, in the ad adversarial path, the gradient is reversed so that. Uh, uh, so that uh, when the secret is unknown, uh, the network predicts the wrong output. Uh, so is there any questions so far? I, I have a question just to increase my understanding. So what is the goal? Uh, what is the purpose of this UNET uh, network? What, what does it do? So UNET uh, will be learning the features. And uh, which will which will perform the majority of the uh, uh, processing. And uh, prediction network and adversarial network are two tiny uh, network that will uh, uh, that will be used to predict the logics. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So yeah, so the unit uh, or the main network will be deployed to a third party. So the user has the data, which will be bound with secret, and the user will transfer this data to third party or inference. Uh, third party will process the all the information of the unit and then it will send it back to the local user and local user use the same known secret for the unbinding and uh, use a smaller network to get the final prediction. Well, thank you. Okay. And our goal is to protect the data and the model so that whoever is using our model, they can steal the data and the model. So the original image is bound with secret. And uh, from the previous slide, you can see that as we are using the bound image for classification, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's impossible, impossible to tell uh, what's in the bound image or what the original image was. So the data is protected. And uh, the train model, since uh, to get the final prediction, you need to unbind the secret at the end of the unit. So without knowing the secret, uh, uh, the third party can't get the correct prediction. So in this way, we are protecting both the data and the model. Uh, Uh, because it's not a probable method, like other uh, encryption method uh, such as homomorphic uh, homomorphic encryption, uh, uh, it's not a true form of encryption. However, uh, our empirical results show the effectiveness and the robustness of our uh, method uh, in hiding the nature of the input and output. Uh, we'll be par we have performed experiment in five different data sets, uh, which are diverse and uh, which uh, cover uh, from handwritten uh, digit of MNIST to uh, mini ImageNet, which is a subset of the ImageNet uh, data set.
So in our uh, experimental results, we performed experiment where uh, no secret uh, finding was uh, performed. So the base model is the same architecture without any protection or encryption. Uh, for all of these data set, the base model has the higher accuracy and the CSPS has uh, slightly lower because of applying the binding and unbinding operation uh, at the beginning and the end of the main network. However, compared to other encryption methods, uh, CSPS uh, accuracy is uh, higher. And uh, even though there are other models uh, uh, which are currently state of the art in these data sets, has mo much more higher accuracy, but uh, they are not robust against ad any adversarial attack. So in the previous slide, you, uh, you, you saw that the accuracy of the CSPS model is lower than the base model. However, the accuracy can be regained by doing the ensemble average of multiple secrets. So the idea is, is that in the, uh, during the inference, we'll be uh, applied multiple secrets to a single image and then take the uh, ensemble average of the prediction. So if uh, you suppose you have a single image and you will take 10 different secrets, uh, randomly sampled from normal distribution, you will apply the secrets to the image and then you will get 10 different prediction uh, because of uh, the 10 secrets. And then you will take the ensemble average of all the predictions. And uh, by doing so, you can actually retain uh, the lost accuracy uh, compared to the base model. So here in the figure, you can see that the secrets are repeated from one to 10. And uh, with more number of repetition, we can actually gain the lost accuracy. So one of the main benefit of our architecture is that it can run really fast. The table shows the runtime result for uh, for all the data set uh, and uh, the timing is to process the whole data set. So CSPS can process the all mini business data in 28 seconds and uh, uh, homomorphic encryptions like for C400 it takes 43 hours and uh, for our mini image net the image sizes are bigger and uh, uh, therefore, it couldn't uh, couldn't perform to process the data in a given time, so we put time out here. And uh, homomorphic encryption actually put a lot of constraint in the network architecture. For example, uh, uh, for example, uh, you can't uh, design a residual network using homomorphic homomorphic encryption which is possible uh, in case of CSPS. So um, uh, even though homomorphic encryption is a probable method, which is much more secure than the CSPS, uh, but in terms of the runtime, uh, we are much more faster than uh, the other alternative, alternatives currently we have. So you see in the block diagram that uh, there is a two stages where the data or processing is performed in the local uh, user site and uh, in the main network, which is uh, processed by the remote third party. And uh, CSPS can offload at least 65% of the complete, and uh, which is netting 2.9 to 3.5% uh, reduction in cost. So uh, any questions so far? Mm, it looks like not. Okay, uh, we'll continue then. So we uh, test, uh, tested the strength of our CSPS model uh, with a different kind of uh, adversarial attack. So 
a realistic adversary obviously have the input and output of the unit R, uh, unit network. So we are sending the data to the main network. So the input of the uh, unit now belong to the adversary. And uh, it also process the process uh, the network information. So it also holds the network output. So a realistic adversary can try to apply the clustering algorithms to find find out the patterns of the data and try to classify them. And uh, we apply uh, five different uh, clustering algorithms on each of the data set. And these results are actually in percentage. Uh, and uh, from this uh, result, you can see that uh, it's quite impossible to cluster the data uh, uh, because of the bound representation, which uh, we develop uh, by binding the secret with the original image. So this is the uh, UMAP 2D embedding of the main network output. So uh, in in figure A, you can see the true class uh, the the 2D uh, data points of the CIFAR 10 uh, the data set uh, with their true class levels and uh, and their prediction of different uh, clustering methods. And uh, from the visual look, it's quite obvious that the clustering method failed to identify the uh, true classes. And now, and, uh, uh, let's assume an overly strong adversary has access to the class levels. So you, it has the model input, which is the bound representation, which will be used for classification. And uh, it also has the uh, ground truth levels. So it can now train its own network to, to perform the classification. Uh, in this case, uh, we found that the accuracy of the adversary would be like 0.1% and better than random guessing in case of MNIST, uh, SDHN and CIFAR 10. And for CIFAR 100 and uh, mini net, their performance would be uh, less than 5% uh, uh, less than five times than the random guessing. Uh, which uh, actually shows the ro robustness of the CSPS or uh, HR secret binding. Uh, as uh, as usual, we also perform the ensemble average of multiple secrets for the overly strong adversary. Um, although it helped, uh, helped the user to regain most of the lo lost accuracy by doing the ensemble average of multiple secrets. However, in, in case of the adversary, uh, it didn't uh, help, for example, uh, for mini image net. Accuracy with the single secret is single secret uh, is four point six six eight percent. However, when uh, ensemble average ensemble average of multi, uh, ten different secrets is performed, uh, the accuracy dropped to two point six three percent. Now uh, let's imagine an adversary has access to some of the training images also. So. It can uh, try to learn what the secret is because the, it has access to the bound image, which is a combination of the original image and the secret. So if it has access to some of the original images, it can try to learn what the secret is from the bound representation by applying projected gradient descent optimization. So in our experiment, uh, uh, we, uh, we, ha we have given a single batch of data as like some, some access to the original data. And uh, uh, in this data, uh, the images are in the left are the original image and uh, the images next to it are the reconstructed image. And uh, in this attack, you can see that uh, the reconstructed images are, are, far, are far from the original image. and. Uh, it's quite noisy and uh, impossible to tell what's in the image. So if an adversary tries to use projected gradient descent optimization uh, to 
find out what the secret is and how to unbind the original image, uh, it will definitely uh, fail to identify them. Uh, another kind of uh, model interaction adversary uh, can be uh, can be uh, by applying auto encoder. So, if an adversary has access to some of the original images and uh, bound images also, so it can apply auto encoder to retrieve the original image from the bound image um, by training an auto encoder. And uh, here in the figure, the left Im images are the original images, and uh, images uh, next to it are the predicted image from the auto encoder. For uh, MNIST, you can see some of the sh uh, shapes arguably is detected by the auto encoder. However, for CIFA 10 or mini net, uh, these are some random blobs of color and uh, it completely failed to identify uh, the pattern or object uh, in the image. So in our experiment, we have uh, experimented with uh, various types of VSA. So more specifically, uh, this uh, vector derived transformation binding, uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a VSA that use transformation ma matrix to for binding and unbinding. You can see that using VTB, we can't actually uh, retreat the original image, uh, and uh, it has quite a lot of noise to it. And uh, in the speakers, you can see a lot of black pixels. Uh, that's because uh, Matplotlib can't show the negative pixels or negative values in the Figure, so that's why they are, they are black. Uh, but uh, in real, uh, in reality, they are the uh, negative values. We, we also try to improve the this uh, vector data transformation binding VSA uh, by making the transformation matrix orthogonal. So by doing so, we actually uh, make it lossless up to a single bound term. And uh, we also experiment with this bound image of IBTB. And uh, we also performed experiment with the uh, Hilbert transform so that uh, uh, we, we used Hilbert uh, transform in, uh, in expectation that it will, uh, it will uh, restore some of the spatial locality of the image. So in the original image, we applied the Hilbert encoding, then applied the HRR, and then applied, applied the Hilbert decoding and uh, so on. And we actually uh, experiment with all of these uh, middle images and uh, try to figure out which one, which combination is the best. So in our ablation study our results, uh, we also used ResNet 50 uh, as the main network. Also, we applied the Re0, which is the ResNet architecture with the uh, learned parameter in the skip connection. And uh, so in uh, various combinations of the architecture, UNET with the 2D HRR, which we are referring to as CSPS, has the highest accuracy. And this experiment uh, is performed in CIFAR 10 data set. So in conclusion, uh, in our work, majority of the computation is performed on an untrusted third party. Where compared to the current state of the art, uh, such as a homomorphic encryption, our CSPS is 5,000 times faster and uh, it sends 18,000 times less data per query. Uh, but unlike those methods, uh, our method is not probably secure, so should be used with caution and uh, should not be used with sensitive data. And uh, we have found the scalability of our, our method is also, uh, is also limited. Uh, for example, the competition for for, for increasing the image image scale from from uh, CIFAR 10 to ImageNet uh, is much higher, and uh, the amount of competition uh, is much more. So scalability is also limited in our method. So this is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please, let, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, so uh, now I open the floor for questions, if any. So let me see. Maybe I, I, I can start again. So uh, with this, um, uh, well, this question is mainly uh, due to my uh, limited uh, uh, knowledge about uh, unit uh, architecture. So, um, so uh, what I understood, so you don't train the unit itself, right? So it's it is used purely for extracting the features, right? No, no, it is trained, but uh, but it can be deployed for inferential step. How, how how is it trained? Can you can you maybe uh, uh, say in a few words? So the whole architecture is trained altogether, but uh, during inference, the unit will be deployed to a remote third party uh, who doesn't has access to the first and last stage ah, so, so basically uh i mean this first and the last stage it, it is involved in the in the training um, um process so basically uh there is a kind of gra gradient um, uh, transfer from the last stage to the unit uh yes and then to transfer the gradient, do you need to bind it again uh, or the or and or basically the, no, 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 basically you don't need, right? No, so basically this branch is working as like if else. So if you have the secret, then give the correct prediction. And uh, if you don't have the secret, uh, so during training, we are reversing the gradient so that it can give the wrong prediction. And reversing is gradient is basically uh, multiplying with minus one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, I have uh, a question, uh, Mahad. It's a, it's a short question, but unfortunately, it's got a long introduction to it to, to set up the question. Uh, and of course, it might be just complete rubbish because I might have misunderstood uh, what you're saying. But if you if you leave it on that slide, please. Um, so you've said that the secrets are the equivalent of one-time pads so i can see how that um, how that works um sorry could you go back to that other slide please mohammed the one we, yeah that one thank you yeah uh thank you um so yeah so that's that that's clear what that's doing uh but the thing is in um bsa hdc i mean um, a binding is a sort of a rotation in the um in the hyperdimensional space so um and so you can see that you know if, if you had just one secret which is applied to all the images you'd be applying uh the same rotation to all the images and the, the point about that rotation view of binding uh is that although you've moved the representation of the image to a different part of the uh, a different location in the space you've preserved uh, all the internal relationships between the components of that uh, that image. So if you just had uh, the one secret which is applied to everything, you know, effectively from the point of any downstream learning, you haven't done anything. You've just moved the uh, the input into a different location in the uh, in the space. So you'd expect that you know more or less anything would learn completely unaffected by that so i think we're one thing which is actually really remarkable about your result here is that you've actually by having a different secret for every image you're rotating each image to a different place in the uh, in the space so that must mean that given that the unit actually works uh, what it's relying on what it's picking up on are the relationships within the image regardless of where they've been uh, rotated to in that input space. And I think that's pretty remarkable as it stands, but that's not the question. Um, 
the question is, so if you're looking then later on, you're talking about adversarial uh, mechanisms and you had, um, you started off talking about clustering. And it would seem to me that clustering would be definitely not in that category of the unit. It wouldn't be looking at relationships within independent of where they were in the space. So I guess the, 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 the final question part of it is, if you were to have an adversarial mechanism, which had this same capability of the unit of being able to be sensitive to relationships within the image, regardless of where it had been re, uh, rotated to in the, uh, in the space, would that then mean that your adversary would be able to completely defeat this uh, this mechanism of using the one-time pads. Yeah, so if I get your question correctly, uh, uh, you are asking like uh, in a scenario where another unit will be used to identify the pattern of the original image from the bound representation, is this correct? Yeah, either another unit or something with the same um, yeah. the same inferential capability of being sensitive to internal relationships without being sensitive to where where precisely those are in the uh, in the space vector space. Yes, so yeah, it could be possible if you have given a lot of data with bound representation. Uh, however, in uh, in the in in our experiment, which, uh, so this uh, could be uh, relevant to your question, where, where you, actually a unit is used to okay. retrieve them. Yes, uh, please go. No, 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 I was, I was, I was agreeing, yeah. So in this experiment, a unit is trained with the, uh, bound representation and uh, you have this like small sample of original training images so we can't give away the all that original images like that's a uh, defeat the purpose of hiding the uh, hiding the information uh, we give some of the information or assume that the adversary has access to some of the original training images without any secret now if we transfer our data to the adversary with the secret uh, embedded to it, uh, can the adversary uh, learn the pattern from the bound representation and uh, identify the original images from this uh, limited amount of original images? And uh, from our experimental result, that uh, we found that for MNIST, it can potentially learn some of the like shapes or close to it, uh, but uh, it's not obvious. And for other data sets, it just learns uh, some of the color blobs or the color densities of the original image. However, it uh, without uh, quite, a lot, uh, quite a, a lot of data, yeah. uh, it's uh, quite uh, impossible to learn. Yeah. But uh, no, if that's... you give a, lo a lot of data, then it's possible. Yeah, that, 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 that's... That I think is is interesting. I think closest in spirit to to, to what I was thinking. And so I think the, the interesting question then would be if you've used unit as part of the CSPS mechanism, and you're using unit as your adversary uh, to characterize, you know, so the conditions that are different for those two units, which which would need to be. Uh, you know, how how would the conditions be different? And you're saying it's a reduction of the data that's available to ensure that what's learned by one cannot be learned by the other. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, so that, that would yeah, be sort of the, the, the investigative of, strategy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one, one of the great. benefit of our CSPS is that the secret bound with the original images not only defined for each of the images, it defined for every single batch. Yeah. So uh, every time it it is trained, it def uh, trained with a different secret. Yeah. And uh, so without knowing the original what the original secret is, and uh, uh, you can only learn by removing the secret or as the we can term as a, 
or noise term. You can learn by uh, removing the noise part. Uh, however, um, uh, without uh, without this, it's quite a, a hard to learn actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you you set it up quite literally as a one-time pad, so it's it's a a separate key on each occasion, and, yeah. and dispose after each single use. No, okay, that's great. Thank you very much. um do you do you have a code to to play around uh, uh, with uh, yeah so it's to available together with the paper yeah it's available uh, with the paper uh -huh. so if you go to our paper uh it's in the footnote yeah i'm 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 very interested and in, uh, in in what you present i'm kind of uh, at this moment i'm struggling to kind of have an into make an intuition uh on why the, does this work i mean so when you pass a, a bound to a image and as rose said so with one time pad so they are virtually kind of orthogonal sequences uh that you pass um, um, be, um simply because uh, by the virtue of um, uh, this one time pad then you net what it what it does basically so it doesn't affect the, the noise introduced by the secret so that you can unbind it and still have some meaningful representations to classify so and i i still i i need to develop this intuition for myself so it's, but it's kind of uh, interesting that it, uh, that it works so okay yeah so to help your uh like uh you might, might be thinking like oh, what is the cost here like it's a properly learning without like is this uh, uh without any cost so the cost is actually the modern uh, cnn can learn c 10 classification with over 95 percent accuracy mm -hmm. so by using this like uh, secret binding process the accuracy is not as high as yeah, 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 yeah. Models. Mm -hmm. However, they are not robust against like adversarial data. So that's one of the benefits we have. Uh, it is robust and effective uh, in, in the presence of adversary, even though the accuracy is lower. Mm. But it's not very, uh, it's not too, um, much lower. I, I mean, looking at your figures, uh, well, that is. Uh, I mean, remarkably high accuracy after uh, all the separations. Yeah, I, but uh, I think it was uh, looking deeper in this work, at least for myself. So, uh, any yeah, on GitHub, so feel free yeah. to uh, check Absolutely. out the and, uh, Yes, I have released a HR library last uh, last year. So the coding. Uh, yeah, that, that was my uh, question again. Uh, th thanks for uh, actually pointing out uh, yourself. Uh, so I was uh, wondering about this HRR Python um, uh, libraries uh, uh, of yours, where it is. Yeah, so it's available on GitHub. You can search it on Google and uh, you can install it with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any more uh, questions? Could I make a suggestion? Yeah, yeah sure. go on. Um, so at the moment, uh, you're doing uh, FHRR binding, and that has um, particular computational uh, complexity. And I see so we've got Tony in the audience, Tony played in the audience, so he can tell me uh, what I've said wrong um, on this. But you've got, uh, if you're doing your Fourier transforms uh, on each occasion, then you've got the you know, the computational cost of that, you know, order, log, whatever. Uh, I was wondering if you could just use a simpler form of binding. So um, if the pattern that you were binding it to was, it was basically randomly selected plus ones and minus ones and just do an element-wise multiply, 
uh, and use that as your one-time pad instead. I wonder whether that would work as well. I mean, this is sort of getting back to the idea that you know, a binding is effectively a, some sort of a rotation-like operator in the, um, in the vector space. Uh, so just you know, element-wise multiplication with random plus ones and minus ones uh, of the image. I mean, assuming your image had been encoded in a way which was compatible with that in the first place, um, would uh, would possibly work as well, but with a, a lower, you know, you avoid the uh, the FFTs. Just a suggestion. I mean, it, yeah. it'll work or it won't. <laughs> well. Uh, let me see. Let me ask again uh, the audience uh, if you have uh, any question to uh, Mohammed, please uh, ask now. Well, if not, uh, then just one uh, comment. Yeah, 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 sure. Go oh, on, so, Graham. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, just to answer Ross's question, I mean, what you're, what you're, what you're. <clears throat> What you were proposing there was just standard XOR encryption, and and so if your if your uh, key is the same length as the the thing you're encrypting, then it's provable that that is perfectly secure. So the answer to your question is yes. If you just look up XOR encryption, you'll see that uh, that. Uh, yeah, if that, you don't if you don't repeat your key, so then if you don't, yeah, which is what what you're doing here. It's just a one time key. So yeah. Yeah, when in fact, if you'd used yeah, if you'd used uh, multiply add permute, um, and that's effectively you know, the elements are plus ones and and minus ones, uh, and that's you know obviously related to to Penty's uh, binary spatter code, which is exactly binary, and in which case it is literally XOR. So yeah, I, <laughs> I was aware of the X the XOR uh, <laughs> encryption. So that's sort of you know, going onwards from there. Thanks, Graham. Mm -hmm. Well, then I would like to thank you, Mohammed, once again for this great talk. Yeah, it's um, just my pleasure to present the paper to you. Yes, and uh, so the uh, recording will be available. So I hope you will also share a PDF with your slides so that I can link uh, link them from the website. Sure. Um, uh, yes, uh, and um, all right. So that was a good start for, for the new season of VSA Online. So uh, please check the schedule uh, and um, um, so we see each other in two weeks from now. So thank you, everybody. And uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.